You're listening to the Artist Athlete, show number 11, My Little Angel in Heaven. That one rhymes. Hello, friends, fans, and enemies. I'm Shannon McKenna, and I'm the host, founder, producer, of the Artist Athlete Podcast. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It's a resource for those working in the industry to share our stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a behind-the-scenes glimpse into this weird world. I'm super excited today because by the time this episode comes out, my second manual, one Arm Positions for Aerialists, will also be available for purchase and download on my website, www.theartistathlete.com. I worked really hard alongside Jen Crane of Cirque Physio, who was my guest in episode seven, to create a guide for aerialists who are looking to push their training toward more advanced positions and for coaches who may want to help students train these positions safely. And because the manual is online, it has video links, it's got pictures, um, it's got some anatomy lessons in there, and it's good for the environment as well. And it's a heck of a lot cheaper than meeting me wherever I am and paying for a week of private lessons to get the same information. So if you're an aerialist and you're ready for one-arm work or ready to coach someone, go to my website, www.theartistathlete.com, and click the section e-manuals. My guest today is Laura Stokes. Laura and I did her interview on a rainy night in her cozy little apartment in Berlin, and we were very comfortable and candid, and as a result, I think I'm obligated to say that both Laura and I drop a few F-bombs during our conversation. And because I don't want to have to mark the podcast as explicit on iTunes, my wonderful editor over at Shared Culture Concepts has been kind enough to insert noises wherever Laura and I swear. (laughs) Um, But if you want to hear the uncensored version, if you find it distracting or if you hate censorship, uh, you can go to my website. And again, it's theartistathlete.com slash podcast. And the uncensored episode is there. Laura Stokes is a zealous movement researcher, educator, and performer. She was a child gymnast, a teenage ballerina, and at one point, a budding yogini. Laura, along with her artistic partner, Cody Harrell, run the Ricochet Project, a contemporary circus duo whose intimate theatrical circus show, Smoke and Mirrors, was the winner of the Total Theater Award for Best Circus at the 2015 Edinburgh Fringe Festival. She continues to create duo and solo work and performs sold-out shows all over the world. She's currently based in Berlin, Germany. Here's my interview with the lovely... Laura Stokes. Mm-hmm. <coughs> oh, that wasn't really a sneeze. But... No. I love saying Gesundheit in Germany, though. I was just trying to clear my throat. Clear your throat, girl. Mm-hmm. Laura Stokes. Ooh. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much. <laughs> Happy to be here. So the first thing I like to have people do is kind of say who they are, what they do in their own words. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm Laura Stokes, and I do all sorts of different things, but probably most relevant to this show is that I run a company and was the co-founder, which is called The Ricochet Project, with Cody Harrell, Um, and we have done all sorts of different types of things, but predominantly in the last number of years toured a full-length show, um, mostly in Europe, but prior to that, lots in the United States. And what's your background? Um, gymnastics as a young child, dance, I danced super seriously as a teenager, went to a ballet or yeah, I went to a performing arts high school and did like the cool. full gamut, like ballet, modern jazz, African tap, repertory work. Um, like if you can show me the choreography, I can do it type style. Yeah. And then got into circus, um, pretty much directly out of that high school. Where are you from? Oregon originally. Okay, Cool. Mm-hmm. And how did that, how did you get into circus? Um, I got hired by a woman who I met at a dance class, beautiful woman, Suzanne Kenny, 
who runs or potentially ran, I'm not sure what the status of her company is now, um, but she runs a company called Pendulum Aerial Dance in Portland um, and asked me to come audition. And I was like, sure, I have no idea um, really <laughs> what this is. Like, you want me to climb on that fabric? Okay. Um, and so that was, yeah, that was how I started. And I worked for her for a number of years and really got, that's how I met Fred. Fred came um, as a guest artist in that first year that I was working for Susie and did a like three month residency or something like that. And cool. there were a lot of other guest artists, um, a lot of company members. And it's how I met Cody. Okay. Um, so Cody came as a guest artist towards the end of my time with that company, and we had a pretty instantaneous connection. Whoa. <laughs> nice. So you met Cody in Portland. In Portland, exactly. He came for a couple of weeks. And then did you move to New Mexico? Or how did that partnership... More or less. How did it happen? Um, Cody came for a couple of weeks, and although I could say it was an instantaneous connection, you, like, you never know. In in hindsight, it was instantaneous. Sure. But he was living at this beautiful Adobe movie theater that you've been to, Penasco, mm-hmm. um, in New Mexico that is an awesome space. I love that space yeah. so much. Yeah, Amazing. Big props to Alessandra Ogren for (laughs) keeping it open and running it. He was living there and was like, yeah, come visit. There's a room. You could rent a room. You could stay for as long as you want. There's a theater. There's not much else. There, You can have as much time as you want. And I was 24 and super hungry for my own creative space. I mean, the entire... The entirety of my access to aerial work had been through Susie, and as amazing as that was, it was like very much in the context of her company and her productions, and the idea of being able to go to a semi-exotic place mm. in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and totally. have unlimited access to a space where I could kind of research my own material, slash my interest in pursuing the connection that I felt with Cody. I went for, I think, three months uh, so, so he was like, you know, we talked on the phone and I was like, great, I'm thinking about coming for three months. Um, I never really left. Like I had put my stuff, I think I sublet my room. So I came back after that three months and like packed my stuff into storage and more or less moved to Penasco, but Penasco as a base for a number of projects that we were running that winter, mainly, um, internationally. So I didn't like fully, fully move to Penasco, but Pinyasco ended up being my home base for a number of years in the first period of time that Cody and I were working together. So you guys moved together, and was the Ricochet Project, like, did you move to New Mexico and you were guys, you guys were like, yes, we're going to make this thing, or yeah, how did... not exactly. Like, he and Alessandra had a tour booked in India that was sponsored by the United States Embassy that started, that was fall when I went, and it started in the winter time. And I was really, really keen to go. I was like, take me to India, take yeah. me to India. Have you been um, to India? I had did you not, go? Well, I did go, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I hadn't been before that. But um, so we started, that was like the first significant project that we did together. Um, and that was very much his and Alessandra's show that I was put into. Um, and I think the following spring, I might have some of the chronology wrong, we made our first duo show, which I'm not exactly clear when Ricochet came into being the name. That name might have been used in India, but the first duo show that we did underneath the name Ricochet was the following spring. And I don't think that we ever, I mean, we're not somewhat to a fault, not not business people. It was never like a long-term plan that we set out to say, like, we're going to do these things under this name. It was like, wow, we have this desire, this momentum, this motivation to make a more or less full-length piece together. Let's have a name that we can do it under. We'll see where it Where did the goes. name come from? I mean, it came from brainstorming. It was definitely Cody's idea. I think I probably <laughs> fought against it. Um, <laughs> and I think we both did, And I think in the end, although I say I fought against it, I think that we both liked the word and also the nature of our working relationship is so back and forth. You know, this like, kind of like, it, for better or worse, I mean, in, in good ways, like, ideas ricocheting back and forth and kind of like generating power through bouncing off of each other and then the other side of it being like moods and emotions and like kind of this like ricochet of like how we've affected each other and um 
Yeah, it just seemed like an appropriate name. Yeah, I, I actually, full disclosure, I saw Smoke and Mirrors in Montreal mm, mm-hmm. a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was there when you guys did the talk back afterwards. Oh boy, what did we say? It was just, no, you guys said the best things. It was amazing. They were like asking you questions like, what is your relationship to contemporary circus? And you were like, oh, we, ha- I don't know what our relationship is. <laughs> you were just like, I don't know. Um, and what else? Oh, you were like, they were like, why did you move to Berlin? And you were like, cause we like to party. It was so great. <laughs> um, but something you guys talked about was your, your working relationship and your, mm-hmm. how you're very honest with each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I, that struck me. I think it's so cool. Where does that come from? How does that I think it comes from necessity. I mean, Cody and I have sure. a pretty unique working relationship in that we are, uh, we're not romantically together. We're not sexually together, but we're very, very partnered. Like we share a whole lot more than just a working relationship and have kind of from the get go. And the nature of our work has more or less necessitated that as far as the like, touring on a shoestring and just being two people, being um, Penasco being a home base, being super remote. Um, and it's also like a relationship that we've chosen to have together. Um, and I think when you have that kind of like daily partnership with someone, you have to be super honest. I mean, there's not really any, there's no way. And, and especially, I mean, now we've worked together for like 12 years where I'm like, even if I tried to like, not, <laughs> he would know. Yeah, yeah he totally. would know. I mean, we just know each other inside out at this point. That's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Smoke and mirrors specifically. Mm-hmm. Talk about, can you talk a little bit about the trajectory of that? Mm-hmm. Um, well, we How did it, it start? It started with you guys having the desire yeah, it to started, make... it started, I mean, quite honestly, it started how a lot of our projects have made, where it's like some kind of like one-off festival for a couple hundred bucks that sounds like a good time, throw some ideas together. Um, was the like initial first draft, like sketch of Smoke and Mirrors. It was super successful. There was a like really, really big audience response to this festival. It was like an outdoor festival in Texas. And we were like, hmm, we could start working with this. We could play this. So then we did a self-produced tour on the West Coast the following, probably about six months later, put some studio time into it, you know, kind of changed a lot of the things from the first sketch of it. Um, And then did a self-produced tour, um, like I said, on the West Coast, Yeah, and then continue to do a number of different runs of shows that were primarily self-produced in New Mexico. I think that was for about a year. We sent out a ton of publicity material to a lot of European presenters. And then my father died, and Cody and I decided that it was a good time for us to take a break. Um, We were both 30. We'd been, like, attached to the hip since we were 24. I was going through a pretty major let's say transformational grief process as well as being the only um child of my father's I had a lot of administrative work to deal with his estate and it was just like yeah this is a really good time for us to just take a pause I think probably the following year we went to Chicago with the show um which was yeah I mean it was an interesting choice for us to take it Shana was interested in it I think I had submitted an application it was kind of like okay whatever we'll give it another go um, we met a woman there, Diane Stern, who's become a really dear friend, who was the manager for Circa, the Australian company. Mm-hmm. And she, um, I think she would agree to this, fell in love with us and volunteered a lot of administrative work. Like we were kind of at a point where we were like, yeah, we've kind of put the push forward with this show. Not a lot came back. We've done what we could with it. Um, we're not really like it's kind of old hat now. Um, and she really put in a lot of effort to like redo our website and contact people and was like super, super gung ho about it. And then through that series of events, um, we had the opportunity, this is all through Diane to replace a show in Edinburgh and the agreement, I mean, the contract, the, that festival is just so brutal that we like pretty much tried to say no and somehow got suckered into <laughs> it. Um, and then someone gave us a huge, well, whatever huge, it was like close to 10,000 or a little over $10,000 to go to Edinburgh. And we were like, okay, we don't have. And the Edinburgh Fringe Festival is, I guess I should 
probably yeah. provide this information because otherwise I'm gonna have to say it later. Yeah. Um, is the largest fringe festival in the world, mm-hmm. meaning that anybody can apply and they have stages all over the city. And yeah, so you can be a big company or you can be a big name, but mm-hmm. also they give the same amount of stage time and the same opportunities to yes and smaller no. companies. I mean, there's like thousands and thousands of performances that happen every day. Mm-hmm. I would call it a marketplace more than a festival. It's really, okay. I mean, it is, they would call it a festival, but it's definitely a marketplace in my mind. And the quality of your venue, the time, the location, the publicity that you get, all of that stuff is very, very varied. And we got in, through replacing this show, we got into one of the, like, there, I think there's three fairly major production companies that run their own, like, mini festivals within the festival that are all very central. They have a fair amount of promotion. They get a fair amount of attention from reporters. <clears throat> we were in a much luckier position than we would have been had we come on our own and rented a theater that was on the outskirts of town or something like that. Um, so I don't think it's fair to say that, like, they give an equal amount of time for different things. Okay. They also negotiate finances really differently. There are large companies that come on contract and get paid from these production companies, whereas a lot of companies like us are liable for paying a ton of expenses and only get a percentage of whatever ticket sales there are, which is why we needed that financial donation, essentially, to make it even a possibility. Like, we were like, this is crazy. We're going to go do our show, like, 30 times in a month and potentially come out of it with, like, $15,000 worth of debt. Um, And then when we got this money, we were like, okay, now it seems... Like now you're only in five thousand yeah, dollars worth of yeah. debt. And yeah, it was actually over ten thousand now that I remember. I think it was like thirteen grand. Um, That's amazing. Did you get that from one person or did you crowdfund? From one, no, from one person who's an amazing philanthropist of the arts. Amazing. Um, part of it was That's a loan, great. and I think part of it came from a friend of hers, so it wasn't all okay. Her. Cool. Um, but yeah, someone who has the has some money and the desire to support interesting projects. Um, That's wonderful. So you went to Edinburgh. So I went to Edinburgh and quote unquote got discovered in Edinburgh, which was kind of ironic for us because most of the people who felt like they had discovered us um, were people that we had contacted, you know, a number of years back about the show. And (laughs) most of them either didn't respond or their response was like, great, send us your European tour dates. And we were like, we don't have any. That's why we're contacting you. But yeah, we had the like Edinburgh dream, which I don't think happens that often, um, which was amazing for us far as like we wasn't we weren't in the program but we like got a bunch of five star reviews in the first week and people were like super you know like we won the total theater award for the best circus show and there was a lot of buzz around our show and so through that initial kind of door opening into the european market we um yeah, started working here. You know, we had like a tour mostly in the uk booked we were like this is a great time for us to move to europe if we live in europe we can take festival jobs for a weekend if we're based in the United States we need like a month of solid work in order to make it feasible for us to be there and for the travel expenses so yeah and then the trip I mean I guess to like finish off like in the last what like two and a half three years uh, it's almost three years since we were in Edinburgh we've mostly worked in Europe doing that show yeah doing that show doing that show at primarily festivals, circus festivals, and a little bit like theater or mime festivals, um, but mostly theater or circus festivals, and a little bit like independent theater bookings. How does it feel? There's this idea of artists who go in and they're the pinch hitters, right? Or they do whatever shows there. They fill in whatever role they need to fill in. I don't they're... think I know what a pinch hitter is. <laughs> oh, a pinch hitter is like in, um, I think it's in baseball, sports mm-hmm. ball. So everybody has to bat but um so the pitcher generally is like they scope pitchers out for baseball mm-hmm. separately than they scope out everybody else right. special pitchers are so specialized so instead of going to bat the pitchers have someone that they can like tag in to hit the ball uh-huh. so a pinch hitter is so like in this metaphor like a really good hand balancer would come in and replace somebody who got injured uh-huh. and it's not their number it's just something that they're doing mm-hmm. to fill the role of the show mm-hmm. And you guys had that Edinburgh dream, I think, in, and an artist dream, and that you made your own material, mm-hmm. and then you were able to perform and be incredibly successful with your material. Mm-hmm. But I'm interested to know how your relationship to the material changed over the time you were, or if it did. Uh-huh. 
Over the time that we were performing in Edinburgh, you mean? or like... uh, Over the time you were performing at Total. Oh, boy. I mean, <laughs> ah, that's kind of a hard question to answer in words because it's so, it, it, yeah, it's so complex. And it's also like my relationship to the material is way more physical than it is linguistic. But yes, my relationship has changed. I mean, do you f- hate it now like no i don't hate it i love the show i mm-hmm. absolutely love the show i That's absolutely cool. stand behind it it still feels relevant to the audiences that we Super play relevant. to it doesn't feel totally relevant to me and my current interest artistically but it doesn't feel like a penance to perform it sometimes i thought like wow it's so strange to have a time-based piece of art that in order for it to be seen i have to enact it like it would be so different for me to like travel with a painting or a sculpture that i made five years ago and say here's this piece of work that i still believe in um i'd like you to look at it but the like enactment and embodiment of it sometimes is a bit of a push i mean it's definitely yeah but there's also a practice and there's something also that becomes like deeply familiar and comfortable where I'm like the amount of rehearsal I mean this last summer we had some just like really breakthrough moments of being like wow we can rehearse this show one or two days and it's easy and we know it whereas like there were times that we felt like we had to rehearse like for hours and hours every day like for a month in order and the things were still f-ed up you know and just like getting to a point of comfort with the choreography and familiarity where it's like there's there's just, and there's discoveries in that. Like, I'm always looking for the, like, new moments. And maybe it's, like, similar to a relationship with a person where, like, trying to, like, keep the lens of, like, what is new, who are you today, keeps it fresh while also, like, appreciating the comfort that can come from deep familiarity where I'm like, oh, it's not, it's not this, like, raw, edgy new relationship. It's something that, like, I can sink into. We, I mean, we kind of joke, Cody and I, like, our soundtrack is, um, all edited into one track and it's like the like press play and go um (laughs) like we know exactly what we're doing um so yeah i hope that answers your question it feels like the like kind of nuances of how my relationship has changed are a little bit harder to talk about and like i said i think it's mostly just because it's really a physical and practical presence rather than like my thoughts or no, I guess basically it. what I was asking is like, I was trying to sound smart and really asking the question of like, how do you do the same thing for so long and not go yeah. insane? Do yeah. you know? And I remember like hearing this Broadway actor talk about once how he did cats for a number of years. Mm. And he got to the point where like, he was like, you know what, today I'm going to go on stage and I'm just going to forget the words. I'm yeah. going to f- up on purpose yeah. because I'm so tired yeah. of doing this. And then you go on stage and you just do what you've always done. Great. Um, yeah, I think I think also for me, there's a big difference between doing my own original material and doing something else. There's an organic quality to it still. Mm-hmm. And that said, there's also times like, you know, both, both Cody and I are in our mid-30s now. I'm 36. And like, there's definitely been times where I'm like, F- man, this sucks to work really hard to stay in shape for something that was exciting to me six years ago and no longer like the physicality and the amount of physicality in that show does not feel like at the cutting edge of my interest anymore and to have to do the kind of like physical training to stay in that shape is like yeah there's days where you're like man this is like boring I'd rather move on to the next thing I don't Mm -hmm. need to do this same choreography and actually I do need to do it and so I need to do it every day for a little while but I don't know, we also haven't had such a, like, heavy, heavy workload with it. And like I said, every show is different. There's different... Yeah, yeah. And we're not doing it right now. And so I'm talking about it, like, I might be saying it from a different perspective if... Of course, yeah. 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 You can only talk from where you are about any of this, really. Yeah. This podcast is brought to you by The Artist Athlete. Did you know that The Artist Athlete is more than just a podcast? It's a growing online resource for students of the aerial arts to deepen their journey to badassery by accessing techniques approved by physical therapists and master coaches in the industry. Our current spotlight is on the Fundamentals of Aerial Alignment, a practical manual for hanging upside down. This online manual is a step-by-step guide. It is complete with photos, 
videos, and exercises that you can implement immediately to help you gain the strength and awareness you need for an aerial practice that promotes shoulder health and longevity and good posture upright so you don't walk around like a gorilla. But don't just take my word for it. Here's circus physical therapist, Dr. Jen Crane of Cirque Physio to tell you more. The fundamentals of aerial alignment is an absolute must have for every aerialist of every level. I can't even tell you how many shoulder injuries I treat that are a direct result of rushing past the basics and attempt to get a trick too soon. In the manual, Shannon deconstructs the fundamentals, including the correct muscular engagement to safely arrive in these positions and the rationale for why it matters. Of course, in addition to all of these fabulous pearls of wisdom, the book is also ridiculously fun to read. It's been lovingly garnished with the Shannon humor we all know and love. Thanks, Jen. Cirque Physio is also featured in the book to give scientific insight into why it all works. Pick up your copy today by going to theartistathlete.com and clicking e-manuals. Listeners of the podcast can get a 10% discount by typing in the offer code podcast at checkout. Again, that's theartistathlete.com, offer code podcast. Now, back to the show. Other projects. That's not a question on there, yeah. but yeah, where are you right now? Other what projects, are you working on? What are you um, doing? I'm going to run a monthly series, super off the cuff, here in Berlin, which I'm really excited about. Uh, like, I don't want to say laboratory because I'm expecting it to be like polished show. Um, but in my time here, I've been... Um, really felt the deficit for experimental platforms for circus artists in particular and been really surprised that within how eccentric and talented the artists are that there's very little format for people to make work outside of like a very typical conservative varieté yeah. format. Yeah. Um, and the other option being kind of like this like in-studio works in progress showing which generally happens like just with an audience of colleagues without lighting, without costuming, which is totally valid. Um, but the culture of making that I really come from and that Cody and I have fostered has been, you know, make your own show, DIY. You have an idea, put it on stage, make a deadline for yourself. Um, obviously, the Penasco Theater has been, like, a huge um, wellspring for us as far as having access to a theater to do that. Also, when we lived in San Francisco, there was a studio that we worked out of that we did hosted a bunch of shows in. Where were you guys um, in SF? Uh, that was at the Vulcan. It was like Studio 5. Cool. Yeah. Um, I lived in, I'm trying to remember which studio I lived in. You lived at the Vulcan? Yeah. Oh, cute. For a summer. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Yeah, none I'm, of us lived in that studio, but we had um, an agreement with the people there that we used it pretty often. Oh, cool. So yeah, I'm doing that, which is exciting. and That's awesome. Yeah. It feels a little bit... Um, like I'm, like I'm a little nervous about it right now um but super exciting here in Berlin and then I have a solo show that I made a couple of years ago which I just absolutely love um and it's a burlesque variety show what I play all of the characters and MC the show <laughs> well it um, is a solo show so I guess that right, would solo show, that but it's a variety show <laughs> um so and the way great. that I've operated it or run it in the past has been like that kind of like typical variety format introduction act and I've had to take pretty big pauses in between the acts because of the costume change like burlesque is not something you can do quick changes for because you've got like the pasties and the bra and the this and the that and the g-string and the this and the wigs um and so how i've run it has been to have like a bunch of my friends in the audience doing kind of like side showy stuff serving popcorn drinks whatever a dj like this kind of like cabaret atmosphere which has been fine um but it's not a feasible formula for me to tour with um so what i'm looking at right now is reworking the show and keeping this like variety narrative but making it create like constructing transitions where I more or less stay on stage the whole time and like there'll be some video projection some narration some like shadow stuff um maybe some of the characters will do dress tees but that it can be a show that can play a proscenium theater which is like the majority of my network you know maybe it has an intermission but it runs beginning to end without um like you know you can't in a black box theater or a proscenium theater be like and now we introduce the act and then there's a three minute pause and right there's a yeah. five minute act and now there's a three minute pause and now there's you know um so that's that's on unless you heart. have like video or some other kind of right. element to it yeah right. that so would... that's that's what i'm doing that's on my horizon i'm super yeah super pumped about that show that's super cool uh, yeah where do you get your ideas where did where did that come from uh 
probably like depression and desperation, to be quite honest cool. with you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Oldest trick in the artist book. Just yeah. Get real depressed. And... Yeah, I think that might be like hitting rock bottom on some level might be where I get my ideas. And I don't really know, Shannon. Um, I mean, people have asked me this before and I'm like, I have the urge to create inside of me where I'm like, there is something inside of me that is like bigger than words that doesn't happen. that doesn't get released in social relationships. Um, that like has to come out of me or I will like implode. And the way that I know how to do that is through making art. And then, so like, that's sort of like this like baseline motor. And then like, the ideas come and it sounds so cliche, but there's like all of these quotes of like masters, right? Where like my best ideas come when I'm not even there. Or like, it's not me who plays the piano. It's like some higher force that like if I open myself and I don't, I don't want to say anything that lofty, but there is something to be said about like showing up to a practice so that like I keep my, my instrument tuned and, and by tuned, I mean not, necessarily like a conditioning practice but like showing up to an artistic practice so that I'm like practcing presence I know you talked about I mean, can we talk about that? Like, yeah, I really, I'm going to ask Practicing about that, presence, but, yeah. practicing feeling, practicing states, practicing my physical skills, looking at, like, where my interest is going, what is, like, riding the forward edge of my physical skills, what am I interested in, and then essentially, like, making some deadlines and hoping for inspiration. (laughs) (laughs) And honestly, I mean, the burlesque show came from a residency that I had booked at the Pinalesco Theater with what I had hoped to be a fairly large variety show with friends of mine. And through the months that led up to it, everybody bailed out. And I was like, oh, f***. I either am going to owe Alessandra, like, however much money, a thousand bucks or something like that, or... I need to go and do the residency and do the show that is going to make the money and kind of just had the like vision for it in that moment of like being like my life right now. Like, what am I going to do? This whole thing has already been billed as a variety show. Um, I was like (laughs) interested in the moment. Um, I had like started doing a little bit of burlesque stuff and I've always been kind of interested in doing a solo variety show, but have been like, Oh, I don't really have, a lot of variety skills like I don't like I don't like do tightrope and this and balloons and juggle and like to do a variety show where I'm like my skill set is like highly developed but somewhat limited like or narrow um and I was like perfect burlesque like it's kind of also this like ironic statement to see a burlesque variety show where you're like it's the same tits and the same ass at the end of every act yeah that's hilarious that like actually affect our perspective of like the tease right and it, you know some commentary on kind of like the neo burlesque movement of like it's just tits and ass at the end of each act like what's so interesting if we know that that's coming but then when it's the same ones so i don't know i was able to get behind it and then as far as the inspiration for all of the acts that i made like that just kind of like comes right We're right just like ah okay and then yeah i make a list those yeah. are always like i can just see myself yeah yeah. Sitting down and being like, this person, this person, yeah. this person. I'm not a writer. No. Um, and I do write, like, a personally, like, I would keep a journal, which is mostly just sort of, like, bah, um, like <laughs> Dear brain, diary. Brain drain. But I'm not, I don't, uh, I do write some in a improvised process oriented way but I don't like I've never been someone that writes down choreography or that like needs to write down ideas like I, I don't work that way cool yeah yeah like I'll write in order to like generate like a, a vibe but yeah yeah I my creative process is like not so in my like not linguistic sure blah, 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 blah. talking right now though you're doing great <laughs> <laughs> I but I really so yeah this the, well, not the whole reason I wanted you on the podcast. I've been scoping you and Cody for a while, actually. But um, uh, the other, when we were in the workshop, God, was that last weekend? It feels like, no, two weekends ago? It was two Whatever. weekends ago. Um, 
you started to talk about presence and this idea that presence can be practiced. Right. And I thought that was so interesting because my idea of performing for so long has been that to be a good performer, you just have to be on stage all the time. Yeah. You just have to go on stage and just get comfortable there. Yeah, I don't know that that's true. I and mean, if you'd be a good performer, I mean, that's like, that's like a huge can of worms to open Right, up. sure, but, sure, sure, sure. But it certainly experience does something to a performer. I'm not, I'm, that, that, but I think this idea of presence and it's, right. I mean, I'm a classically trained actor and we were constantly fighting to like live in the moment on stage, right. you know, like be mm-hmm. in the moment. And when you started to talk about how you can practice this idea of being in the mm-hmm. moment, I was really interested to know your approach or when you intentionally go into those right. practices. Right. Well, I think, I mean, I... I work so much with emotion, and so, like, improvising from an emotional impetus is, like, one of the ways that, like, a simple way to describe practicing presence. Um, Hmm. And maybe I would use writing in that context, like, to, like, write about, like, whatever I was, like, trying to trigger and kind of, like, sit with that material and really, like, get it into my body and then do some improvising from there. Or potentially use choreography that I already had set, but try to, like, bring that kind of thing. And I'm also a huge fan of... um, like looking at range, like doing opposites. So yeah, different improvisational exercises. I also have spent a lot of time in the kind of like post-contemporary improvisational dance world. People who study state-based stuff. Some of it like is anatomically related. It related. Some of it is like super esoteric. Like one really great example, and we look at this a tiny bit in Fred's workshop is like. I think a lot about like internal presence and external presence and like eyes closed making eye contact are like Mm. really concrete ways of working. So like, can I, as a performer on stage, and this is something that for me within Smoke and Mirrors, what's gotten interesting within the familiarity is I feel like I have the option to actually experiment with this kind of thing while I'm on stage because the choreography is 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 known and familiar but it's like can i simultaneously exude and generate and sit in a very very internal place and be extremely extroverted can i make eye contact with everyone in the audience where do i oscillate between these two can they happen simultaneously or do they just happen in oscillations making eye contact with an audience you expect to have an audience there you could also make eye contact with a training partner and do a whole piece of choreography maintaining eye contact. It's amazing that like how difficult it is for people just to make eye contact for like five minutes. You know, like that kind of thing is like that that is practicing presence. Mm. Um, can you make eye contact with someone and like hold a personal narrative? Can you hold um an emotion or something that's like really honest for you? Or do you lose that as soon as you make eye contact with someone? Can you do a choreography that is motivated by that emotion while making eye contact with someone. Can you do it with your eyes closed? Like the, and those are just like two examples of like practicing presence, but looking at range, right? Like kind of like the like furthest, like big and the furthest small. And then just like basic state based work. Like if I do a warm up where I like shake and jump a whole lot, like that changes my physiology. Or if I do a warm up where I like hold child's pose for a half an hour and it gets to a point where like my entire body is burning just from like holding this one very simple position, that generates a different kind of presence. Those are tools that like can easily be practiced. If I'm looking at like trying to work on material that has a certain, that I want a certain energetic quality to, I should cater my preparation to generate that kind of energetic quality. Does that make sense? That's brilliant. Yeah, Yeah, I love it. Um, It makes so much sense. And yeah, I mean, there's so many things that you can say about presence, but, but yeah, I think, and I think like, God, I mean, acting is I am not a professionally trained actor, but I've been floored by going to see some theater shows in the last couple of years after seeing so much circus and being like, I love it. Like every single person in this show is amazing to watch. I'm like, (laughs) oh, right. Because their marketing, like the skill that they are hired for is being interesting to watch. And how many circus shows where I'm like, at the end of the day, like, there is some amazing skill on stage, but I don't want to watch anyone. And like these theater shows where like, you know, it doesn't matter. Any character comes on and you're like, oh, yay, I want to look at you. <laughs> um, so funny. And, and so I think, I mean, I would imagine, and like I said, I haven't, I've worked with a bunch of physical theater people. 
um, in casual situations. I've gotten a lot of it kind of from the side. Um, and like I said, I've done a lot of kind of research within the contemporary improvisational world. I don't know, but it seems like theater is teaching presence or teaching the practice of presence. For sure. You for know? sure. But it's interesting, like even this idea of internal and external, right? Mm. Uh, like you think about in theater, you have like really Grotowski based or these uh, Polish and Russian idealists who are saying you change your physical state and that changes what happens inside of you. Right, right. And then you can go the other way where you can work on an emotional state and that causes a physical change. Right, right. And it sounds like your approach is more of the, I, I do something or I make my body a certain way and that brings up the emotion that I'm trying to make yeah. in a piece. Yeah. Yep. Well, then that, that relates to what I was saying about like warm up and preparation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I wouldn't say that that's true for like performative work. Like I generally go into it with a fairly clear idea of what the, what the emotion and what the movement is. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Because that's finished work. Right. That's like, you yeah. know what that's about. You're yeah. not creating anything yeah. anymore. And there are, I mean, there are, yeah, I don't, I, I don't think I'm as linear as that. <laughs> No, it's only like in retrospect that we can right. even like actually be able to talk about any of this. But that's what's so interesting in like, I mean, this podcast is called the Artist Athlete Podcast. Mm-hmm. And it's so interesting to have these people on who talk about the athleticism and talk about, you know, like how much they train, what they eat, what they, and like, I love that we've just had almost a 40 minute conversation and people don't even know like what circus skill you could possibly do because it doesn't matter. Like there's yeah. an equal amount of importance on the approach and the, yeah. what you're yeah. doing with what you am, do. I mean, as much as I can identify as a circus artist, I definitely relate to a dance theater aesthetic way sure. more and dance theater like value system. Um, have you ever done any like traditional circus or have you ever been in uh, that? <laughs> I took a traditional contortion class once and felt like I'd been run over by a train for about a week afterwards. <laughs> not really my jam. I'm not going to ask you to um, name names. <laughs> yeah, no. Maybe afterwards. Um, and yeah, not so much. I'm like, haven't I? I mean, I've definitely like trained a little bit with coaches who do some traditional stuff, but I would not call them traditional. Like, there's this woman, Helene Embling, French woman who teaches at the no. Nika School. Do you know her? Yeah, I know She's her. so awesome. She's so She's sweet. She's so awesome. And she certainly is someone who I think, like, probably is very familiar with some traditional skills. Oh, yeah. But I don't think that what we did with her would count as traditional at all. Um, yeah. I mean, she saw Cody's trapeze. This is a beautiful quote. This is years ago, but she, like the first night that we worked with her, she was like, oh, I can see you are very contemporary. This is nice. It's so interesting. You are so contemporary. But you know, this thing you do, it with the two heel hang. This is so typical. It would be much nicer you do one heel and the other foot behind the head. (laughs) And we were both like, oh, oh yeah, just, uh, we'll just change the choreography. (laughs) God bless her. No, she's great. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, so we're running out of time. Okay. But the last question that I ask everyone on the show mm-hmm. is, what advice would you give to little Dear. Laura Stokes at the very beginning of your trajectory I don't into know. this madness? Shannon. I know, dude. I know, but I'm like, uh, maybe like take a course in um, how to file taxes in Germany? Uh, internationally, U.S. and in Germany. You've had to, like, yeah, probably take, like, a a course in filing taxes as an independent artist. I'm not really sure if they offer one, but it's, like, shocking to me where I'm like, what was I doing in school for so many years? How come I never had a class in taxes? Right. Um, or in any finance. Maybe, like, maybe everyone else's taxes are more simple than mine. But, like, <laughs> I'm like, no, it would be nice. I'm like, the advice I'd give was, like, I don't know. Yeah, take a class, take a tax class. But where do you even find a tax class? Um, that sounds so so lame. No, that's not lame at all. Take a tax class. That seems like the best advice. Take a tax class. Yeah, it's great advice. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, thank you for coming on this show, oh Laura Oh my God, you're so welcome. It was awesome. Yeah. I'm going to stop recording now. Okay, great. <laughs> That was my interview with Laura Stokes. I love how real Laura was about her and Cody's journey with Smoke and Mirrors. They had this amazing show and they knew it and they were trying to contact producers in Europe, but at first they could just not get their foot in the door until they were discovered at a circus festival in Chicago and had the help of a connection and sponsorship to go to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Laura was also really honest about Edinburgh. She defined it as a marketplace, a place where performance artists were trying to sell their work, and Smoke and Mirrors was really well positioned to be received and get attention for their efforts. At the festival, those same producers who ignored them before were now clamoring to book them. And I think this is a great story to hear for anyone who's trying to work professionally or get their work noticed. Just because you're constantly sending out your material, especially if you're not on the same continent as the place you want to work, if you're not getting a response, that doesn't necessarily mean that your work isn't valuable or bookable. Bookable, I don't don't know if that's a word, but you guys know what I mean. You have to go out into the world and you have to show that work. And that means entering festivals and self-producing and going to open stages and showing up to auditions. If you want to work professionally, it's not enough to sit at home at your home studio and keep just training and creating. You also have to get out in the world. Yes, you do have to have a bit of luck to get the break the Ricochet Project did, but as Laura describes, they worked for years making connections and being on stages before their Edinburgh dream came true. So it may look like luck, but that luck took years. So if you have a similar dream, don't give up, but do get out or something like that. I feel like there's a, there's a snappy phrase of advice and wisdom in there somewhere. And the second really cool thing that I wanted to touch in on that Laura talked about in the interview is this idea of presence or training not only your physical state or your tricks or your skills, but also taking time to work on the internal aspect of the art form. That is, what is your emotional state when you're doing your number What do you do? How do you feel? Where do you look? When do you breathe? When you're going through your choreography or your skills. If you want to find out more about the lovely Laura Stokes, you can go to her website. It's www.laurastokes.com. That's L-A-U-R-A-S-T-R-O-K-E-S.com. And I'm, as always, at theartistathlete.com. You can follow me on Instagram at the underscore artist underscore athlete. And I've created a group on Facebook called Friends of the Artist Athlete Podcast. So if you want to give me feedback or answer some questions that I have about the podcast, it will be all happening right there. If you like the show, subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. And next week, I have Brandon Scott, Acrobat. So tune in for that. See you then, guys. Bye.